Hi there, Catherine Walters from The Knitted Raven here again with uh, the final installment in the introduction to Viking style wire knitting. Uh, in today's episode, you're going to learn how to use your draw plate to uh, finish off your wire knitting and to get it ready for jewelry making. Um, also in this video, I'm going to insert a few pictures of different types of jewelry that can be made with Viking style wire knitting rope as the starting point. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back. So I got a little carried away last night and did um, actually 10 wings, wingspans of wire before I stopped. I decided I wanted to have a good length of um, wire knitting fi to finish up um, and I might use it for a couple of projects in future videos. Um, you'll notice that I, I kept pushing it up so I actually pushed it up off the dowel a fair bit and even at the very end I was still working on about halfway up the dowel and that's deliberate because it's a lot easier on the wrist and you'd be surprised holding it here how much the copper wire will weigh it down over time. Anyway, um, first thing you need to do if you haven't done it already is you need to twist you need to twist your work on the dowel and you'll notice I'm twisting uh, in multiple places because otherwise the um, I'll just end up twisting a section and I want to keep this nice and straight if I can do it at all. So once you've got it twisted and you've loosened it up a bit, here's where Armstrong training comes in. You need to pull this off. Now resist the urge to grab this end because if you do, you will start stretching this bit out and you don't want to do that yet. That's what the draw plate is for. So it's really a question of twisting and pulling the dowel out of the wire. And keep an eye out because you'll want to loosen up your grip. Um, I'm slowly loosening up these fingers as I get closer to the top um, because I don't want to squat the end of my knitting. Not after all the work. So now you can see. There you go. I have knit a fair chunk of wire there. Now, before we go any further, I, there's something I probably should have talked a little bit about for those of you who are looking at getting into jewelry making for sale. One of the things that I did when I was making jewelry for sale using Viking style wire knitting was I made sure that my wingspans were of uniform length. Um, I think about 42 inches. I used to have, um, um, inch measurements across the front of my workbench in my old studio so I would measure them off the same length so that way I knew exactly how much wire went into a piece like this now I told you a minute ago I did 10 sections so say for argument's sake that each of these sections um, was 40 inches long that would mean that there was 400 inches of wire in this and that becomes relevant because it's 400 inches to uh, create um, however long this is once you've finished it. And that way, say for example, I don't know, for argument's sake, say this finished, finished this was 24 inches long. I'm not exactly sure what it will be, but just say for argument's sake it was 24 inches long. Then I would divide 400 inches by 24 inches uh, to figure out how much wire I actually use per inch of finished chain. With copper, you might be not as worried about calculating um, exactly what you've got, uh, used in materials, but once you get into silver and gold filled wire, I guarantee you it becomes very important to know how much you've spent on materials. So do keep that in mind, okay? Um, another thing that uh, um, I want you to keep in mind is the time that it takes you to uh, do a section of Viking style wire knitting. What I did in the outset was I used to, um, I have a Fitbit on my arm. So I would, either using it or the timer on my phone, I would start the timer going and the minute I, f I finished a section, I would stop the timer and I would record it. And after I'd done that off and on for a couple of days, I, I figured out what my average time was. Now, this is like regular knitting. The more you do, the faster you will get at it. So, um, uh, say, for example, going back to our example of 10 sections, for argument's sake, say it takes me 15 minutes to do each each particular section. That means there's 150 minutes. That's a that's an hour and a half. That's two and a half hours. So um, 
as you can tell, your the time adds up pretty quick. And it's important if you're making jewelry that you get paid for your time. Don't fall into the trap of taking your material cost and tripling it because that's a way to burn out and wonder why you're never making enough to make it worth your while. Anyway, moving on uh, back on to um, the, today's business. I want you to get your 26 gauge wire and I want you to cut off three pieces that are about a foot long. I've done one. And why you need these will become apparent in a second. Oh, tip number two for the day, or actually it might be tip number three. Um, working on a baking sheet, it can be a real time saver um, because you can leave what you need on the, uh, the baking sheet. It helps contain any bits, especially if it's lined with a, a bead mat. And uh, when you're done, you can just lay it to one side. And when you want to bring it back, you can bring it back out. Now, I've taken a few things off of this, including the pill bottle that holds my um, tapestry needle, the little uh, pill bottle that's holding my ends of wire, as well as my draw plate and a few other bits and bobs that won't actually scrape my table. But for the most part, it keeps things nice and contained. So if you've got an old baking sheet kicking around, you might want to press it into service. So you've got your three pieces of wire cut. We're going to use these in a second to pull our wire through the draw plate. But before we do that, we have to cut this loose. Now, you, you can see the stitches where this attaches to the carriage. Oops, sorry, I struck the camera. Sorry about that. You can see the way they loop up over there. You can cut through that. But save your petals, don't cut into your petals, because uh, you can reuse that. You don't have to make it again. This can live on the top of your dowel um, and stick out of a, a pencil cup or other such doodad that might be with your craft supplies. So now, as you can see, we've got a crown of stitches at the top. And this is where your wires come in. You want to thread the wires through each wire goes through two stitches and they should be opposite each other. Okay? Like that. And you're going to do it again. And one last time. The purpose of threading the wires through the opposite stitches is to evenly distribute. Oops, my aim is off. Is to evenly distribute the. Um, I still missed. Good grief. Is to evenly distribute the the tension when we actually start pulling this through the draw plate. And once you've got your wires through, I just take them and give them a few little twists just to help them hold together. And before we bring in the draw plate, I want to um, get you to take a closer look at your wire knitting. It's pretty rigid right now, and you might wonder how does something so rigid become a nice fluid chain? I mentioned in an earlier video that what the um, draw plate will do is it will cause the tube to narrow and as the tube narrows the stitches get uh, larger and the gaps between the stitches they'll get smaller. As you draw down this will become more fluid in its movements. However if you draw it down too far it will start to stiffen up again. So there's a sweet spot for every gauge of wire and number of stitches and you need to keep that in mind. Okay. So the first thing you do is you look for a hole, 
actually the first thing you do is if you have a knotty end of wire sticking off like I just did, you get rid of it. And you look for a hole in your draw plate that's close to the size of your knitting. I think that's where I'm going to start. So I feed my wire through and holding it, I pull it through. It literally is as simple as that. Now I'll go through a couple of times. Actually, I think I'm going to cut that off so that's a little bit more even. There we go. Now, uh, did I go through that one? No, I did not. Okay. Now you go up to the, the next hole in size. You see I just wrapped that around to give it some leverage, and I pull it through. And it literally is a series of, of, I guess, Armstrong exercises, for want of a better description. The first time you pull it through a particular sized hole will be the hardest. Once it gets easy to do, you move down to the next one. Now you can already see this is already starting to become much more flexible. I'm down in the third hole here, so I go back there again, pulling it through again. And you keep up this process going down through subsequent holes until we get to what I call the sweet spot. And we're not there yet. I'm working on, um, I think it's an eight millimeter hole now. This one happens to be marked in millimeters. Some of them I've seen online aren't. They're actually marked in inches, but it helps you keep track of where you're, uh, where you're working. Now I'm getting close to where I want to be. I like to go two or three times through each hole because it helps smooth out any irregularities that happen to be there. Now, this isn't a bad width right now, okay? And I think the last hole that I went through was, hmm, let me double check that. Should have been that one. Oh, yeah, it was. Okay, that one was five and a half. The next one down to it is five. I may take it down once more because I think it can still go a little bit further. Yeah, that's the last one. I won't bring that down any smaller. There's the five again. Okay. Now, isn't that lovely? You will remember I had a length of chain that was about as long as my dowel. And I have almost doubled it. It's not bad. Um, if you did six lengths, you've got enough for probably a bracelet, and that's going to be the first project video that I post. But we still have a little bit of work left to do on this now. I want you to take your fingers and gently run your fingers over. Now I'm bringing this up. You can see that little bit there? Okay. We have to deal with that. But the first thing I like to do is use your fingertips because your fingertips will tell you where the bits are sticking out. Now all I do with these is I get in as close as I can with my wire cutters without clipping the chain. And I just hook it off. Then I take the end of my chain nose pliers and I will push that in. That is all there is to getting rid of those ends. Now I'm looking at the timer on the video. I'm already up to 14 minutes. So I'm going to end it here. There will be a couple of pictures tacked down to the end to show you uh, some of the things that actually you can make with this as a starting point. But it's really important that you deal with those ends and you will know you have dealt with them all when you run your fingers over this and you don't feel any sticky bits, uh, pointy bits sticking out. So take the time to go through them. Um, 
The darning needle, the blunt end of the darning needle helps to tuck the ends in. Also, the fine end of your chain nose pliers can get in and push things in. Be careful when you're cutting those bits. You do not want them to fly off into space. Make sure you've got your finger uh, above where you're cutting so you don't accidentally send a sharp piece of wire out across the kitchen or whatever room you happen to be working in. Anyway, you now have a nice length of uh, Viking wire knit, almost ready for jewelry making. Thank you for uh, joining me through this introductory series of videos um, on how to do Viking wire knitting. In future videos, I'll be focusing on how you turn this into different types of jewelry. I hope you'll join me. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so you don't miss future uploads. And if you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Catherine Walters, Knitted Raven, signing off for today. Cheers.